worship is found when we come together and sense God's presence and listen to God's word and celebrate this time together with joy. I greet you all this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. A few announcements that I wish to bring to your attention. Our thoughts, lift it up in prayer, reach out to our office manager, Rebecca, who's recovering from an onslaught of illnesses that have kept her hospitalized this past week. She is home again, regaining her strength, and we wish her Godspeed and a hearty, healthy return to our church office, assuring her of our concern and our care. And we have learned that Marg and Dawn Smith are now having to isolate themselves as they cope with COVID's seemingly endless presence. As well, we certainly wish them Godspeed and a quick return to good health. And I want to express a big thank you to Don Coleman and to John McDougall uh, for putting together this morning's worship bulletin and the announcements as well. A job that requires a good deal of technological skills and a job that's been well done. Thank you, Don and John. And we extend our hearty congratulations to Sheila and Rob on the birth of their grandson, Anthony Evan Mills, born last Thursday, September the 5th, and weighing seven pounds, six ounces. She was particularly proud and honored that her daughter, Morgan, and son-in-law have carefully chosen a good family name, Anthony. And uh, uh, that is how we will be known and we extend to all the family our very good wishes. Concerning meetings this coming week, uh, the steward, the Board of Stewards will be meeting at 1.30 on Tuesday afternoon. And later that afternoon, on Tuesday, the session will be meeting at 3 o'clock. Uh, uh, please note that change uh, uh, for, from the, uh, the announcement that's printed in the bulletin. Are there any other announcements that anyone wishes to make? Yes. <coughs> Not so much church related as human humanitarian. Uh, I felt impelled to tell you that on, we live on a dead end road. One family of four, two boys and their own dad, collected cans, pop cans, for a whole year from a garbage collection system. They raised five hundred dollars this year for the food bank. If you have, and people who are listening at home, if you have cans, pop cans. Instead of throwing away, find out where you can give them so someone else could take them and use them. Or you could take them in yourself if you find a depot. It was so worthwhile, and these are young children who did this. Well done. That's a, uh, that's a wonderful project, and we'll keep it in mind. Thank you. The lighting of the Christ candle. Christ is the light of the world. In Christ, we see and receive the light of life.
are here. It's number 342, you servants of God.
Please join me in the litany of response.
We come now to our time of offering. We give in gratitude for all that we have received, all that God has given to us, and we give faithfully to God's church that it may continue to serve in God's name with work uh, for the well-being of this community and areas far beyond our reach around the world. So let us with gratitude give to God our gifts and our offerings. Our scripture reading this morning is from Acts 14, and it follows through with our, our trip with, uh, with Paul. But Jews came there from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the people, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they believed. Then they passed through Pisidia, and they came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there, they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled. And when they arrived, they gathered the church together and declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. <coughs> May God bless to us this reading of his holy word, and to his name be glory and praise. Our hymn, True Faith Needs No Defense, and More Voices, number 139. <laughs>
Let us pray. Ever-present God, confront us here and now in the midst of our living. Grant us your peace while we face our fears and increase our trust that we may embrace life in its fullness. Speak to us the word we need to hear. Empower us to be the body and spirit of Christ in our time. Amen. Today brings to completion our unintentionally long disrupted series of sermons titled Journeys in Faith. Off and on throughout this summer season, we have been following the course of St. Paul's first missionary journey. It led him and his valued friend Barnabas across the island of Cyprus, over to the coastline and into the heartland of Asia Minor. The route is laid out on the map that you see in this morning's bulletin. Interestingly, this map shows all three of Paul's missionary journeys and gives you an idea of how far flung his mission journeys extended throughout Asia Minor and Eastern Europe. All this land was a significant part of the Roman Empire. The venture began in the year 45 A.C.E. They returned about four years later in the year 51. During that time, they covered more than 1,200 miles, about 2,000 kilometers. We don't know for sure what was their normal mode of transportation, but certainly wasn't, it wasn't the kind of travel as we experience and know it naturally. Part of the trip was by ship, which for Paul was never a very pleasurable experience. He was not a sailor. Aboard ship, we are led to believe that he was often seasick. Given the choice, he much preferred to travel by land with solid ground at his feet. We can assume that Paul and Barnabas covered most of this enormous distance on foot. You can be sure that it was slow going and exhausting. Venturing into the heart of Asia Minor, the land now being called Turkey, they were required to cross over a rugged Taurus mountain range. It was isolated and dangerous country, and there were no hospitality inns and restaurants along the way. Each night, they would have to set up and sleep in a little tent which they carried with them. They were at the mercy of the elements, vulnerable to wild beasts and possible attacks from thieves and bands of hiding. They had the blessings of the church, but they had no sponsors. One way or another, along the way, day by day, 
they had to meet their own expenses. If, in their earlier years, they had been able to build up a worthwhile savings account, you can be sure it was fully gone by the end of this trip. Maybe this was one of the factors that led them on their homeward way. These are some of the things that help me to be reminded of the enormity of their efforts and of their sacrifice. It was an enormous undertaking, and I don't think they looked at it in that light at all. Instead, they understood it in terms of opportunity. Paul was a very intense man. Everything he did, both before and after his conversion experience, was done with passion. Now more than ever, he was driven to do this work by an invisible, invincible power that had taken hold of his whole being. Christ was the new, highly charged, driving force in his life. Christ was the one who supplied the context of his living. Christ was the one who had come to be the content of his living. He called it being in Christ. He knew himself to be a man in Christ. He was determined to do all that he could to make this new life in Christ known to the world. <coughs> it had become his newfound reason for being. One time, at the end days of his ministry, he wrote a letter to his friends in the church community of Philippi. Even when he knew that his life was nearing its end, he was pleased and proud to say to them, But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Clearly, there was nothing nothing at all that could dissuade him from proclaiming his eternal gratitude and praise to God for all the goodness, the grace that God had extended to him and to all the world that was around and beyond him. Along the way, back home, Paul and Barnabas passed through regions of Galatia and Pisidia. It presented them with some of the most stunning scenery in this part of the Roman Empire. Scenic vistas of mountains, valleys, rivers, and lakes. Yet, for all that, there is no indication that Paul gave so much as a cursory glance to the natural beauty that, pre that frequently surrounded him. Oddly, he makes no mention of it in any of his writings. One is left with the impression that he was not a lover of natural beauty. I regard this. Um, I regard this lack of interest to be rather unfortunate. 
but given his own particular circumstances and situation, I can see it as being understandable. For him, the beauty and grandeur of nature was something akin to paganism and idolatry with sharp focus placed on fertility and crop reductions and religions that often practiced sexual promiscuity and even human sacrifice. He found no value, no worthwhile purpose associated with this kind of nature religion the spectacle of mountains and lakes and fertile, productive farmlands were for him of much lesser importance when placed alongside the bright, glorious morning star of his newfound faith in Christ. The vision that captured Paul was more beautiful, more breathtaking, more resplendent than any possible formation of rock and water, wood and meadowlands. His mind and heart were set on the making and the strengthening of Christ's new body, the Church. On their homeward journey, Paul and Barnabas would return to visit the little churches of Galatia in the cities of Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch in Pisidia. In each of these places, they helped to build up the church. In the words given to us in the Acts of the Apostles, they went about strengthening the souls of the disciples there, exhorting them to continue in the faith. They appointed elders for them in every church and committed them to the Lord. These couple of sentences stated so simply, almost belied, the amount of hard work that they been, had been called upon to do. Building the church meant strengthening the souls of the disciples there and attending to the many administrative needs and concerns that belong to each congregation. Enormous time and energy would have would have gone into their many tasks and they would not dare leave the churches of Galatia until they could manage adequately on their own. Concerning Paul's lack of information and apparent, uh, his lack of information and apparent lack of interest in acknowledging the beauty of the natural world around him. There is one more comment that I wish to make. Later on, in one of the letters which he wrote to the church people of Corinth, he tells them directly about one of his most severe misfortunes an infirmity that badly interfered with all the work that he wanted to do. He called it his thorn in the flesh. Three times he appealed to the Lord that it would leave him, but all he heard the Lord say to him was, and I quote, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. What 
was this misfortune, this infirmity? He doesn't tell us. We don't really know. But interestingly, he does give us a clue. At the end of the letter, which he sent to the churches of Galatia later on, he took the pen from the secretary who was writing what Paul was recording. And Paul wrote in his own handwriting, and I quote, See what large letters I make when I am writing in my own hand. With this personalized statement, it could well be that St. Paul's thorn in the flesh was in fact his own severely badly functioning eyesight, poor vision, blurred images, inability to see anything clearly, probably beginning from the blinding light at his conversion encounter way back on the Damascus Road. So you see, all the natural world, its strength and beauty, were, in the eyes of St. Paul, nothing much more than blurred images, fuzzy objects, hazy pictures, anything but being able to see the world around him in sharp and clear focus a sure and certain thorn in the flesh that aggravated him terribly for most of his life. Yet, in the stress and pain of it all, he was able to say to his church friends, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, I am strong. Especially in Christ, Paul dared to find strength in his own weakness. I also believe that a significant portion of this strength came to St. Paul from his beloved, faithful, ever gracious companion, colleague, and friend, Barnabas. What a challenging, exhausting, inspiring venture it proved itself to be. Together, they had dared to enter into an unknown world to them, proclaiming the good news of God's abiding, steadfast love, reaching out to all people in all places, punctuated and personified by the triumphant life and work of Jesus Christ. They were exemplary builders of a new world order. One which our world today, amidst all its wild sound and fury, desperately needs to hear and value and cherish for its own good sake. And may we, we who are church, stand tall and do our part to prepare.
perpetuate the inspiration of their courageous and noble handiwork. Amen. Our preparation for prayer, also found in more voices, number 45, you are holy. support us all along the way through the strength and presence of Holy Spirit. We take part in all that you have done and we cherish all that you continue to do. There are many forces that act upon us in the course of every day. There are times when we eagerly build ourselves up at the costly business of belittling others. There are many times when instruments of war overrule the nobler principles and blessings of goodwill and peacefulness. There are times when we need to grow strong in spirit, holy spirit, in tune with human spirit, and thus lead a happy and enriching life. Thank you for the life and inspiration of great men and women of faith, and for stories that help enlarge and increase 
are living day by day. And we thank you for enabling us to behold wonders and dreams of that which is sacred. May we never lose sight of them, for they are visions of life in its wholeness, the fullness of life to which we all aspire. In this beloved, yet ever broken world, we dare to commit ourselves evermore to your holy cause. We do it with hearty hymns of praise, with the assurance of the gift and the power of love. Amen. And all God's people say, Amen. The prayer of our Lord, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The closing hymn in this morning's service, Bless Now, O God, the Journey, number 633.
from our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this day and forever. Amen and amen. Thank you.